Wonderful. So good morning, good afternoon. I'm Nalini with the Law Society. I'm sitting here with my fellow members in the boardroom uh, in Iqaluit. I wanted to tell our members that the PowerPoint presentation has been uploaded this morning. If you go onto our homepage on the CLE section, um, the first CLE save the date November, if you click on that, you'll have the three November events, the event at the bottom. If you scroll down, you'll see uh, Caroline Briand's uh, presentation um, for today. So I wanted to uh, thank Caroline Briand uh, for joining us, us today on this very interesting uh, topic. Uh, Caroline Briand delivered this year in review uh, back in 2019 pre-COVID. Um, and we just uh, really enjoy having Caroline reach out to us again and doing the years in review for 20 and 21. Merci beaucoup, Caroline, uh, de partager ton expertise, tes connaissances sur un sujet tellement intéressant. I'm going to turn it over to Caroline, who almost made it to a Kaloui today, but actually her uh, leg from Montreal to Ottawa is the one that was unsuccessful. So she was not able to uh, make it, unfortunately, but I'm glad that she was from Montreal. I'm Perfect. So I'm going to put our camera off and I'm going to turn it over to Caroline Abria. Caroline has uh, close to 15 years of practice in law and she was, uh, she became a member of the Nunavut Bar in 2017. It was really delightful. I'm also a member of the Quebec Bar. So it's wonderful to be able to also have a colleague and share some commonalities uh, from our, both of our regions. So merci encore, Caroline. Over to you. Well, thank you, thank you, Nalini, for uh, for having me. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, for attending the presentation uh, today. Um, as Nalini, as Nalini said, unfortunately, I I'm very sad that I'm not uh, in person with uh, with you in uh, uh Today it would have been uh, it would have been a pleasure. But uh, if there is a one silver, silver lining or one good thing that has come out of the, the pandemic is uh, the, the facility uh, to, um, to organize uh, meetings like these, um, even if we're far from, uh, far from one another. Uh, so as Anini said, uh, today will be a, uh, uh, just bear with me one second. <laughs> I'm very sorry about that. So that was uh, in another uh, another game of uh, dog versus house plant. Uh, the house plant has lost uh, one round. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so as as Anini said, uh, we um, uh, we did the first uh, the first uh, edition of. Uh, the year in review uh, in uh, Aboriginal law in December 2019, um, not knowing that uh, would have to wait a few years until uh, we could redo the uh, uh, redo the same uh, redo the same presentation um, or the same um, the same concept. So I'm happy to be uh, to be with you to share. Um, some news and what uh, what's happened in that uh, field of practice uh, since uh, since twenty uh, since twenty twenty. Um, I will be sharing my screen and going through the presentation. Um, please feel free to uh, to interrupt me and jump in uh, and start a conversation throughout the presentation. Um, hopefully, we'll have some time to so just have a uh, uh, a free form chat at the end of the uh, at the end of the presentation but uh, if you have a question right away uh, don't hesitate and just uh, and just jump in um, and by all means uh, those who are having lunch uh, do continue and uh, enjoy your uh, your uh, your lunch uh, while we while we proceed um, so I will share my screen and let me know if 
um, at any point if you cannot see it. Is everybody seeing it uh, okay? Yes, Carolyn, all is good. Okay. Okay, so let's um, so let's uh, let's start. Um, so, um, of course, in the last two years, there was a lot that um, uh, there was a lot to choose from. There was a lot to uh, that has taken place uh, in the field of um, Aboriginal uh, Aboriginal law. Uh, I will use the term Aboriginal law, meaning uh, Canadian law as it applies to its Aboriginal peoples, uh, the Inuit, the First Nations, and the Métis, uh, as opposed to uh, Indigenous law, which uh, to me and to others uh, have, the, uh, have the meaning of Indigenous systems and pre-existing systems of, uh, uh, of law. So I will concentrate on the I will concentrate on the the former, um, and mainly what um, what has arisen in the in the courts, uh, and also uh, what is uh, uh, what are the developments and the uh, the issues that we can um, expect to hear about in the in the next uh, in the next year. Um, I've divided up. Uh, the, the most interesting uh, decisions and the most interesting case law uh, in uh, three major topics. Uh, the first um, is uh, mainly for the litigators uh, amongst uh, amongst you. Um, so uh, cases that um, make us think of new strategic considerations uh, when litigating uh, indigenous rights. Uh, be it treaty rights or uh, ab Aboriginal rights, so everything under Section 35. Um, the second theme is uh, social acceptability and Indigenous perspectives uh, in decision making. So taking it, taking those two uh, notions into consideration. Okay. Afternoon, Yeah, that's all right. Or if somebody else comes in. No, no, oh. Am I muted? Uh, no, you're not. <laughs> oh, I'll mute myself. <laughs> That's okay. Um, uh, and the, the third, um, the third uh, main theme is uh, ident I uh, indigenous identities and uh, colonial borders. There was a, a few interesting, uh, very interesting uh, decisions that were rendered on the, under that theme in the uh, since uh, we last met. Um, and lastly, uh, we'll conclude on uh, what uh, what to expect, what is uh, uh, what's in the pipeline uh, of appellate courts uh, in terms of uh, Aboriginal law for the uh, for the next year. Um, so, uh, thinking of thinking back of on the last time that we met in December twenty nineteen. Um, we were uh, uh, we were expecting uh, a new um, a new framework in judicial review uh, that came at the, the, in the very last uh, weeks of uh, of December uh, 2019 in the in the case of uh, of Vavilov. So that's one thing that has changed since uh, since we last were here. Um, we also add a. a we also had a little pandemic, uh, and uh, now fresh off the uh, the last uh, the, the recent climate meeting in uh, in Egypt, uh, I was going to say the the whole world, but at least part uh, part of the world is um, uh, is is reckoning with uh, the climate crisis at a time where there's also an economic crisis. So that's that's our context. That's where we are. Uh, and those three elements of context may very well inform the, the decisions and, well, the application of the decisions we're going to have a look at, but also how, um, how decisions um, uh, and 
will uh, might be decided uh, in the in the near future. So starting with um, starting with uh, the first team, so strategic considerations in indigenous right uh, litigation. Um, the first uh, the first case I wanted to uh, talk to you about is the decision of the Supreme Court of Canada in Southwind. Uh, the main theme or the main issue in that case was the the issue of uh, the assessment of equitable compensation uh, as a remedy uh, in the context of um, uh, federal government taking up uh, reserve lands. Um, the First Nation that was that was involved was the Laxal First Nation, which is a Treaty Three Nation uh, in Ontario. Um, early um, in the uh, in the twentieth century, um, there was a development of a dam and of a reservoir to uh, uh, to supply uh, the to supply Manitoba to supply the city of Winnipeg. Um, and by constructing this dam and in particular the reservoir, um, a large part of uh, the Laxal reserve land was flooded. Um, and it was also flooded in a way that it separated um, the remaining lands um, into uh, into different portion and isolated parts of the parts of the reserve lands. Um, under the Indian Act, as it was drafted, as it existed uh, at the time of when the, the dam was constructed, um, it was. Uh, it was permitted, it was tolerated that reserve land could be expropriated for public use, such as uh, constructing uh, infrastructure in the nature of a, of a dam, of a reservoir. Um, nonetheless, the nation filed, um, filed a specific claim. Uh, and I've included in the presentation all the gory details about the litigation process. So um, the, the claim was first submitted um, through the specific claims process in 1985. Um, and uh, subsequently, uh, the, 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 there was a, a claim filed into the course in 1991. Trial took place in uh, 2016 uh, and went all, its, all the way up to the Supreme Court uh, in 2021. So that's... Um, uh, I think it's, it's I think it's relevant uh, for all of you who, uh, who practice in, in litigation and legate indigenous rights. Um, that's an important case, of course, but the, the costs of just getting there are were just enormous. Um, so the issues before the court um, essentially pertain to um, first the in, in terms of the liability, in terms of uh, was there an obligation uh, while well, looking into the conduct of Canada? What was the nature of Canada's fiduciary obligations towards the Laxal First Nation? And the second part uh, was well, if we conclude that there is a uh, there was a breach of fiduciary duty, uh, what uh, how are we to assess uh, equitable compensation uh, and equitable damages in that? Uh, uh, in that uh, situation. I was getting my key, I'll put my head. That's okay. So um, at, the, um, at the federal court uh, level, the court found that there was indeed a fiduciary duty owed by Canada to the First Nation. Um, and that Canada was, uh, as a matter of fact, in breach of its fiduciary obligations. Um, the trial judge awarded uh, Thirty million dollars in equitable damages to the First Nations. The uh, the Court of Appeal did not um, did not uh, interfere with the, the trial decision. Um, in the court, in the Supreme Court, um, the um, uh, well, the, the first part, the part about the, the fiduciary uh, duty, is the um, I think it's an interesting and recent recap of the principles uh, 
regarding the nature of uh, Canada's fiduciary duty towards Aboriginal peoples um, and what, uh, what it requires um, from Canada, specifically where land uh, is involved. Um, so in this case, uh, the, the court highlight, the majority of the court highlighted that um, fiduciary duty involves or mandates loyalty, good faith, full disclosure, uh, and the protection of the First Nations quasi-proprietary interests from expropriation. The word expropriation will become uh, important down the road. Um, the main part or the most interesting part of the Southwind decision is precisely that. In terms of uh, assessing uh, the appropriate um, remedy, so uh, in this case, equitable compensation, um, the uh, the framework that the court, in the, the words of uh, Justice Karakatsanis, described um, is really tailor-made for that situation. So breach of fiduciary duty from Canada towards its uh, uh, towards uh, First Nations and Indigenous uh, peoples. So it departed from the model that the, the trial judge had uh, initially followed, a model that was based on the rules for expropriation. So it might sound the same. It may uh, evoke the same ideas, but it's not. Uh, it's not the same relationship, and it's not the same mechanism. So the remedy has to be, the remedy has to be different. Um, and the one, uh, the one bit that um, uh, that uh, the one takeaway from uh, the the framework for and the principle for equitable compensation set out by the court um, is that the court must assess um, not only what was the, the value uh, of the property at the time, but also uh, what was the loss of opportunity for, uh, for the First uh, Nation. Pr presuming that presumption is also important that uh, the First Nation would have made the most favor favorable or profitable use of that property. Um, so when it uh, in, in practice, uh, what it um, what it uh, it boiled down to, so the value um, uh, the value of the uh, of the loss was to be assessed in two parts. First, the value of the flooded land back in the day, uh, but uh, the lost opportunity to uh, the lost opportunity to uh, receive value for the for the uh, for the intended use um, in this in this case uh, building a uh, building a, a dam and, and the reservoir for uh, for the city of uh, of Winnipeg. Um, so ultimately, the, the case was sent back to uh, the trial court for uh, a proper reassessment based on those principles. Um, the dissent, um, the dissent took a uh, took a different uh, view, um, and um, well, uh, took a more conservative uh, took a more conservative approach to uh, what type of uh, uh, what type of loss was to be considered. So, um, Justice Cote. Um, boxed it in, uh, boxed in the loss of opportunity to the loss of opportunity to negotiate a deal, uh, as would have been the case in uh, 1929, uh, rather than the loss of opportunity with respect to the value from uh, from the project. Um, as you will see, there there's sort of a trend with Justice Cote, so that's why I I wanted to. Uh, I wanted to highlight or, or dissent in the uh, in that case. Um, before I move on to the next uh, to the next case, are there any questions at this point? Uh, 
Caroline, this is Nalini. I'm monitoring the chat room. So if anything comes up, I'll okay. definitely uh, bring it to your attention. I have one quick question. Okay, thank you so much. We have a question from Jonathan Park here in the boardroom. Go ahead, Jonathan. So the understanding I have right now about that last case in essence was the trial judge's decision was upheld, but the remedy was modified or, or adjusted in light of Karakatsanis's focus on the lost value of the, the lost actual value of what actually happened. And the comparison in the dissent is that Cote was focused on sort of a general loss of opportunity to use the land as you wished. That's kind of what I'm taking from that. Would that be a correct takeaway? Uh, yes, it would be a correct uh, a correct summary. So the court did um, did uphold the, uh, the trial judge's decision on uh, the breach of fiduciary obligation and the, the type of uh, the type of remedy, uh, but corrected uh, provided guidelines as to the proper approach for uh, equitable uh, the assessment of equitable damages. So send the case essentially send the case back to the trial judge so that he could um, proceed to the adequate assessment having in mind uh, the principles and the framework uh, set out by Justice Kai Katsanis. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, so next up, uh, next topic are advanced, uh, advanced costs um, in the case of Anderson uh, in Alberta. Um, it's a, it, it's an important, uh, it's an important topic because uh, as we've seen from the what I call the gory details from the um, uh, for the from the Southwind decision, it takes a lot of time um, for those cases to reach uh, a final judgment, especially in higher courts. Uh, those are cases that uh, consume an awful lot of resources. Um, of course, the the time of uh, the indigenous governments that we uh, uh, that we uh, that we bring those cases uh, on behalf of whom we bring those cases, um, but also uh, um, also in terms of uh, of monetary resources uh, at uh, in circumstances where uh, there are many needs to be fulfilled and resources can be uh, can be scarce. Um, so in that, um, uh, in uh, Anderson, um, it was the Beaver Lake First Nation that had applied for advanced cost uh, in a Section 35 uh, Indigenous Rights, um, uh, Indigenous Rights uh, dispute. Um, so the uh, Essentially, what what, be, what the First Nation um, was arguing that yes, we have we have some rem we have some revenues, we have uh, assets um, that are of some significance, but we have a growing we we have those needs, we have those uh, projects that are important as well, um, and we're essentially uh, asking the the court well. How, what's the degree of uh, impecuniosity of impoverishment that uh, we should sustain before we're allowed to, uh, we're allowed to claim uh, advanced costs? Um, how poor, how poor are we? Uh, should should we get? And to what extent should we put on hold other uh, projects, projects uh, to fund uh, to fund litigation? Um, so that's um, that's a very pressing question to uh, to which uh, courts have at time provided very cynical answers. Um, so on that uh, in that particular case, um, the, um, the the trial judge found that uh, the Beaver Lake First Nation had uh, many pressing needs that there was proof of those needs um, and could not. Uh, could not be uh, asked to choose between funding the litigation and funding those uh, uh, those needs. Uh, 
the uh, the trial judge's decision was eventually overturned by uh, the Alberta Court of Appeal. Um, so in the in the Supreme Court, again uh, written uh, by uh, Justice Kakatsanis, um, the court. Uh, the court confirmed the Court of Appeals decision to overturn the trial judge's uh, ruling, um, but said some very interesting things and provided very useful guidance with respect to uh, the impecuniosity requirement and what is, uh, what is required, uh, especially for First Nation to uh, be allowed to claim advanced costs. Um, what is, um, uh, I think one is the, the main, the main takeaway or the, uh, the, the main quote from that, uh, from that case uh, is the recognition that uh, there's a uh, the course in their decision in making that decision on advanced costs do have a discretion, but they can also, they can and should take judicial notice of uh, the impacts of colonialism on the uh, on First Nations, and especially as it affects their capacity to access the judicial system and to vindicate their rights. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's moving it's moving one step forward from that cynical uh, that cynical perspective where. Uh, to advance rights, your rights as a First Nations or as an Indigenous group, you have to impoverish yourself, uh, and you have to choose which evil of colonialism you you have to you have to fight, and are constrained to fighting only the one uh, at the time. Um, the court was also very useful in um, uh, reviewing or. Um, Coming back on the, the test for impecuniosity, um, and uh, um, and reminded courts that it has to be yes. While they can take, they have some discretion. They can take judicial notice of colonialism and, and its effects, but it also have to be their analysis must also be grounded in uh, in the uh, in the evidence and in the in the reality. Um, so that's uh, I inserted a quote that I found was uh, was interesting in a good summary of that uh, of those principles. Uh, so we are therefore content to affirm that there is an that an applicant genuinely cannot afford to pay for the litigation where and only where it cannot meet its pressing needs while also funding the litigation. And as we explained further below, where the applicants of First Nation government pressing needs must be understood from the perspective of the First Nation government. So that's um, that's a step forward uh, uh, towards uh, towards reconciliation and to and a, a step further from that uh, that that's that uh, what I call it cynical uh, approach to advance cost. Um, so Kakas and this uh, in her um, uh, provided some useful guidance on uh, assessing. And circumscribing uh, the pressing needs of a of a first uh, of a first nations. Um, so in four uh, in four steps, first you have to identify what are those pressing needs. Um, while the onus uh, is on the first nation applicant, uh, then there what there has to be evidence on the extent of unfunded pressing needs and also on uh, prospectively, how the how resources would be uh, allocated. Uh, the third step is to assess the applicant's financial resources, uh, including uh, revenues, um, uh, funding from different uh, public or private sources, um, and so on. Uh, and lastly, uh, there has to be a um, there has to be a, a thoughtful and relatively thorough uh, assessment of a estimated litigation costs and also uh, of the position, the financial position in which the First Nation would find itself uh, taking in consideration that estimate 
of litigation costs that estimate and uh, anticipated uh, allocation of money on pressing needs uh, versus uh, advanced advanced costs and the the, rev the existing or anticipated revenues. Um, all, all that boils down to um, there, there to the fact that there has to be uh, there has to be evidence on uh, all of those four first steps, and that's uh, uh, that's where the um, that's where the uh, the trial judge uh, um, mistake was. Um, so though the uh, though the court the Supreme Court was not uh, uh, well did not completely set aside the, the possibility that the uh, the the first nation was entitled to uh, to advance cost uh, they did uh, they did conclude that the trial judge did not have that uh, evidentiary support to make his findings so uh, the case was uh, redirected back to uh, uh, back to him Any question on Anderson before we uh, we move on? I have a question about that one. Yes, Karen, I'm going to turn it back to our boardroom. We've got Jonathan Park again with a question. Hi there, Carolyn. Hi. Uh, I'm very confused by this decision, especially given the fact that in the point about the assessing the applicant's financial resources, you point out at paragraph 47, that conversely a finding of impecuniosity cannot be made even when there is no detailed evidence. But, um, you know, I, I'm understanding you to say that there's got, has to be a, a detailed assessment of their, their financial abilities. And I'm wondering if you could clarify that for me because it sounds to me like the court tried to talk out of both sides of their mouth on that one. Um, it's, um, I, I think you're right on talking on both sides of the mouth. Um, because when you, when you read a decision, you, you can feel that the court has that, uh, uh, sort of walking on eggshells and is very cautious not to, uh, not to set, uh, the bar too high or not to, uh, to list too precisely the type of evidence that uh, that would be required to make a case for advanced costs. So they're very careful. Like they, they tell you what the recipe is, but they don't tell you what's in the grocery list. Um, so, uh, pardon that. I hope the metaphor didn't add to <laughs> more confusion than <laughs> than necessary. <laughs> but uh, that's that's the feeling that you that the feeling that you that you get. They want to. Um, uh, provide more flexibility, while at the same time, uh, while at the same time, uh, clarifying the, the framework, clarifying the, the requirements. Uh, but the the tiptoe around the uh, the specific type of evidence and the the specific threshold that uh, that would be um, uh, th that would be necessary or that would be uh, acceptable. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Yes, I, that's why we have jobs as lawyers, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I uh, I pity the poor judge. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Caroline. Um, so the the next um, uh, the, the next uh, topic that we're going to move uh, to that we're going to move to and uh, look at um, is social acceptability and indigenous perspectives in decision-making. Um, so um, one, one case that's very, uh, that's very interesting uh, that came out uh, in early January, so it's uh, 2020, so it's not, uh, it's not exactly, it's not exactly new, but in the, um, it's, it's, it's very current in terms of um, uh, of its impacts and how it um, 
essentially opens the door to other um, uh, to new uh, to new arguments and new um, ways of engaging uh, governments from a, um, an indigenous perspective. Uh, is the case of uh, Ressources Stratégico and Procureur General du Québec. Um, so it's a, it's a case that uh, was decided in the Quebec Court of Appeal. There was a leave to appeal to the Supreme Court that was uh, uh, that was dismissed. So that's that's a final uh, that's a final judgment. So it um, it came about in the context of uranium mining in, in northern Quebec. Um, the company Stratico had acquired claims uh, for uranium uh, in the in an area. Uh, close, well, relatively close to uh, a few Cree communities uh, on their uh, on their treaty land. So in the the land covered by uh, the James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement. Um, that uh, that treaty, that agreement as uh, uh, as its own uh, impact assessment mechanism. So when we refer uh, in, in the slides in the decision to COMEX, COMEX is uh, a mixed Cree and Quebec uh, impact uh, impact assessment uh, mechanism. Um, so the um, uh, following guidelines from from COMEX and following uh, best practices, Stratico engage with uh, local stakeholders, including uh, non-indigenous municipalities, but also uh, but also with the the affected Cree communities. Um, for the Cree communities, it was uh, the position with uranium was essentially over our dead body, and the Cree nation government, the central government for uh, the Crees or of of Quebec, um, essentially said that th there wouldn't be uh, uranium development on Cree lands. Um, so, um, in order to start. Uh, the development of the projects, Tradeco needed also um, uh, authorizations from the minister, the Quebec Minister of Environment. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm really, uh, like the, the, the names for the ministries, uh, for, for the Minister of Environment, Quebec changes approximately two to each two uh, to three years. So it's it's not called the Minister of Sustainable Development, the Environment, Wildlife and Parks anymore. It's, it's something else. Um, but uh, is the minister that uh, that uh, is responsible for that type of authorizations? Um, so the um, the min what's where it becomes interesting is that the minister, uh, despite the fact that most of the municipalities uh, were uh, open to to the mining project, uh, the minister um, uh, took notice and took action. Uh, face with the, uh, uh, the the conclusion that the Crees uh, absolutely did not want that project to see the light of day, uh, and refused to issue the the certificates that Sateco needed to go uh, to, to go ahead, based on uh, the lack of social acceptability of the project. Um, in the meantime, uh, the uh, the Quebec government also issued a temporary moratorium on uranium mining, um, which uh, in the end uh, incited Stratico to uh, uh, to file a claim for damages against Quebec, um, so both in compensatory damages and punitive damages based on. Uh, what it called, what it construed as Quebec uh, about face on the authorization of the project, um, and uh, especially um, especially based on Stratico's um, uh, Stratico's understanding that it had done, it had checked all the boxes, it had uh, in terms of the steps of its engagement plan with the municipalities with. Uh, with indigenous communities. So Sareko was basically saying, well, we did all those steps. What more do you want? We, we're entitled to get our certificates of authorization. Um, despite Sareko's uh, approach, there were 
um, there were some issues during uh, engagement. Um, according to the decrees mostly, there was a lack of transparency um, and a lack of uh, true dialogue. So Stratico provided information, but did not really, uh, uh, did not uh, fully answer questions that were asked by uh, communities. There was a lack of mutual trust. Um, and it became it had it became clear at one point that while Strico was trying manifestly to check all the boxes in its engagement plan, that they were expecting a specific result. So that result being that that would be sufficient to get social acceptability. And secondly, that it would be sufficient to get those authorizations from the, the Minister of Environment. Um, so the Quebec Superior Court dismissed uh, Stratico's claim in damages, um, and the Court of Appeal event eventually uh, dismissed Stratico's appeal. Um, so there were a few uh, there were a few issues before the Court of Appeal. Um, so whether the first was whether Quebec, through the Minister of Environment, um, had uh, engaged its liability towards Stratico by basing its refusal uh, to authorize the project on lack of social acceptability. Um, circling back to uh, the notion of expropriation, whether that refusal amounted to expropriation of their mining claims, of Stratico's mining claims. Um, and there was also a, a more, a, a lesser issue regarding um, uh, the duty of Quebec to um, uh, of coherence in decision making. Um, what I'd like to focus on, however, is uh, social acceptability, and particularly as it uh, involves uh, uh, engagement with uh, with First Nations. Um, the court. What is interesting that is that uh, the the Court of Appeal does provide in the decision a, uh, a definition for social acceptability. It's, it's a buzzword uh, that we, we hear a lot, that floats a lot in, the, in, the, in today's context. We hear about uh, um, ESGs and uh, CSR and so on, and social acceptability is one of those, uh, uh, it's one of those buzzwords that, uh, that floats around, but is there is there a legal definition? Is there a a court sanction, if you will, a definition of it? Um, so uh, it um, uh, it uh, the, the court of appeal. What's interesting um, defines social acceptability as a as a process, but also as a um, but also as a result. Uh, whereas, um, if you compare it to the duty to consult um, under uh, uh, under the principle of the honor of the crown, it's essentially uh, it's essentially a process, and we assess the sufficiency uh, and the thoroughness of that of that process, bearing in mind that uh, there likely isn't a right to to veto a uh, to veto a decision. Um, and that um, the duty consult cannot um, is not uh, is not linked to a particular is not linked to a particular result. Social acceptability is a bit different. It's not a constitutional obligation. Um, it's a legal obligation in some environmental laws and some environmental uh, assessment frameworks. Uh, it's also it also has the characteristics of a moral obligation towards uh, stakeholders that can be affected of for a project by a project, and it's ultimately it's a, it's a result. When we say that there's social acceptability, it's a um, it's like a stamp. Uh, it's like a stamp of approval. So you have it or you don't. Um, so in um, so in the, in that case, what's also very interesting in terms of the importance of social acceptability is that the court deciding on the issue of Quebec's uh, uh, liability uh, essentially says that in this day and age, uh, 
social acceptability is a component of the feasibility of a project. And that a sophisticated project proponent, such as Strateco in that case, should know, should be aware that social acceptability is a condition uh, for the project's feasibility. So if they don't meet that condition, the projects will not, uh, will not, I cannot legitimately go uh, go forward. So Quebec was not uh, was not at fault for uh, was not at fault for refusing to issue certificates of authorization. It's not just an excuse they they hid behind. Uh, they were justified. Uh, they were fully justified in doing so. Um, why this case also matters and why it's also uh, important is because um, it uh, it provides another way, another angle through which um, uh, indigenous perspectives on the projects and its impacts can be considered. So as I said, it's different from uh, the framework of the duty to consult and accommodate uh, indigenous peoples. It's it stems from stems from something else, from other sources. So it's another angle uh, that can be uh, that can be used uh, to um, uh, to force either governments who issue uh, authorizations and permits and licenses, uh, and towards all uh, towards private proponents. Um, so there's a um, it's, it's relatively it's not that totally new but it's still a recent decision so it's uh, uh it will be interesting to see how the uh, how the reasoning um and how that concept of social acceptability will be um will be used and will be uh i was going to say weaponized but uh it's not it's not exactly the right uh, word or perhaps will be uh to uh to make sure that local communities and indigenous communities in particular uh, can be heard um, in different, uh, uh, in the context of uh, the development of their natural resources and their territories. Um, do you guys have any questions? We're good, Caroline. You can you can move on. Yep. Oh, there is no. Nope, we're nope. good. <laughs> we're good. You can move on. Okay. Um, I'll go quickly on on that one. Um, that's an appeal to federal court uh, of the decision Makivik Corporation and Canada. Um, for those who were there in 2019, we had uh, had a look at that decision very briefly. Uh, so that's the that's the appellate decision for. Uh, uh, in a case where uh, the Bankivik Corporation, which is a body that uh, represents, politically represents Inuit, uh, the Inuit of Quebec, uh, pursuant to uh, the Nevik Land Claim Agreement uh, and the James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement, so two treaties, um, were uh, filing a judicial review with respect to the minister's, uh, uh, federal minister's decision to uh, to set uh, harvesting levels for polar bears in, uh, in a particular uh, area of the uh, Nunavik uh, marine region. Um, one issue that was at stake is whether the minister, had, um, as the treaty uh, required it, uh, given adequate, um, adequate consideration to Inuit traditional knowledge. Um, and whether it uh, whether it had failed to um, adequately uh, communicate its concerns uh, with respect to the the methodology for um, uh, Inuit traditional uh, knowledge um, in a motivated adequately motivated decision. Um, So um, that the decision can be generally interesting in terms of, um, to the extent that it recaps um, the applicable principles for interpreting modern treaties, such as uh, the James Bay Northern Quebec Agreement and the Nunavik uh, uh, Land Claims Agreement. Um, 
And with respect to uh, the specific uh, the specific issue of um, balance uh, of including taking into consideration Inuit traditional knowledge and balancing that knowledge uh, against, or rather, harmonizing that knowledge with um, Western uh, scientific data. Uh, notice the the air quotes. Um, the uh, the court of appeal said that the they were satisfied that the, the minister had indeed taken uh, into consideration the, uh, the the Inuit traditional knowledge, but however it failed to abide by the uh, the mechanisms set out to do so in the treaty themselves. Uh, so they, uh, they failed to communicate that they had concerns about the methodology followed to present the ITK, um, and they failed to provide adequate reasons uh, to, um, to set aside the, um, the, uh, the conclusions based on ITK that would have allowed or contemplated higher harvesting level for polar bears. So the um, I guess that the main the main takeaway for uh, for that decision um, is that uh, the mechanisms uh, that are found in a treaty in terms of decision making in terms of um, the information that has to inform uh, a minister's or a body's decision those are not optional. Uh, even if in the end the result perhaps will be the same, uh, those mechanisms are not optional. If uh, if consultation, if there's a, a specific way in which consultation has to happen, or that uh, indigenous traditional knowledge has to be taken into consideration, um, those guidelines, those mechanisms have to be followed. It's not decorative. It's not optional. Um, before I move to the next uh, to the next topic of indigenous identities and colonial borders, are there any questions on uh, on Stratico or on Makivik? Yes, Caroline, I'm going to read you a question. I see Lawrence has a question. Should we expect social acceptability to work both ways? For example, could a community's desire to have a project proceed, compel a regulator to allow the project. And Lawrence, you're also welcome to uh, unmute yourself if you wanted to add anything to your question. Caroline, do you have enough information yes. to respond? Yes. Go ahead, please. Well, um, I think it's I think that's an excellent point and. Uh, I do believe that it will be the case, and it, it does work both ways. Just like the uh, uh, the duty to consult and accommodate can work uh, can work both ways. Uh, for example, um, in um, in the, the in the recent uh, reference uh, in Alberta uh, to the Alberta Court of Appeal on um, on the uh, the Impacts Assessment Act. Uh, of Canada, uh, the the majority of the Court of Appeal uh, uh, criticized the uh, the argument that the that uh, indigenous peoples uh, uh, necessarily, uh, when they are consulted, uh, will uh, uh, will work against uh, development of uh, the development of a project or uh, resources, and the the majority of the the court in that reference. Um, acknowledge on the contrary that in in many cases there uh, because of prior engagement or adequate prior engagement uh, between uh, a proponent and an indigenous group um, the indigenous group will uh, will have negotiated will have obtained uh, necessary reassurances and accommodation for the impacts of the, the project may have on its uh, on its rights and on its lands, uh, 
Um, so those are conditions in which social acceptability can uh, uh, can exist. Uh, likewise, th there was the case before the uh, in 2021 before the, the federal court of appeal, uh, Ermin Skin First Nation, where um, there was a um, there was an environmental assessment that eventually blocked the development of a project uh, for which the Ermanskin First Nation had a, uh, an impact and benefits agreement with uh, a coal mining company. Um, and the, uh, the Ermanskin First Nation uh, successfully argued that uh, the, uh, uh, the, there was an obligation on the Crown um, before it stopped the project and before it started that uh, uh, impact, uh, impact assessment procedure uh, to uh, consult and accommodate the First Nation that had an IBA with uh, the mining company and was looking forward to the development of that, uh, uh, of that project because they, they had negotiated the impacts and were satisfied with the benefits uh, that the uh, and the mitigation measures that they, they would be getting. So um, I, I think it's, it can absolutely work both ways. It's not, it's not monolithic, um, and it's not. It would be it would be naive to, um, or stereotypical rather, to suggest that it can only go uh, that it can only go one way. Uh, but it's all it boils down to a matter of uh, of engagement. Uh, and substantially uh, coming together and addressing the uh, addressing the needs and concerns for the host uh, the host communities the communities and people will suffer will suffer the impacts of the of the projects and making sure uh, from a proponent perspective from a government perspective that uh, those those needs and those concerns are genuinely addressed. Thank you, Caroline. And Lawrence, do you have a follow-up questions for Caroline, or are we? Uh, no, I don't. But th thank you very much for that uh, response. This is it's certainly thought-provoking. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Well, oh, thank you. Thank you, Caroline. You can move on. Um, okay. So the the next uh, big th the next and last the big theme in in this presentation is uh, indigenous identities and colonial borders. Um, so, um, well, essentially, what happens to um, what what happens when uh, indigenous rights claims, especially land claims, clash with uh, borders that were imposed uh, quite arbitrarily by uh, the English or the French uh, back in the back in the day. Uh, so, the first case that's uh, that's interesting. Um, is uh, the case of Newfoundland Labrador Attorney General and Washa Unwet. Um, so two, there were two First Nations, the Washa uh, Unwet of uh, Washat and Malutenam on the Quebec North Shore, uh, and the, the Inu of, uh, of Matsmekush Lac John, uh, up north, right like smack on the border of Quebec and Labrador. Uh, we're suing two mining companies, one of them being um, Iron Ore Company of Canada, uh, with respect to uh, iron ore mining projects that had gone on uh, on their traditional lands without compensation since the 1950s. Um, so the if you picture a um, if you picture a map of Quebec and the, like the triangle that uh, the triangle of Labrador, the territories of those two uh, nations range from the uh, the Gulf of the Saint Lawrence up to uh, up to uh, the Labrador uh, uh, the Labrador border and if you say if you will midway between the the Gulf of Saint Lawrence and the Ungava Bay. Um, so that's essentially a, a caribou range. Uh, and it also follows a uh, uh, the mining infrastructure uh, for uh, iron ore mining in the area. So there is a uh, there is a railroad. There are different uh, pits. There are different plants, uh, and so on. Uh, so the two uh, the the two mining companies were really operating in the the heart and the core of. Uh, the traditional lands and contemporary lands of those two uh, of those two nations. 
Um, so essentially what happened is that the, the Newfoundland, uh, uh, the province of Newfoundland, Labrador, uh, uh, issued a motion to strike from the application and the claims uh, with respect to declarations and to uh, remedies on the territory uh, of Labrador. Um, both the Quebec, uh, the Superior Court of Quebec and the, the Quebec Court of Appeal dismissed uh, Newfoundland's motion. Um, and, and I don't want to go too uh, technical into Quebec civil law, uh, but essentially what the, the courts, the, the lower courts uh, held was that the um, uh, an action for declarations on indigenous rights is not an action, uh, is an action in REM. Uh, it's not a real, an uh, action real, as we'd say in Quebec civil law. Um, so that's, uh, so that would not be in the nature of um, uh, precluding the uh, the First Nations to uh, uh, to ask the a Quebec court to uh, make declarations, to issue declarations with respect to uh, the territory of another province or territory. So essentially, that um, that reasoning was upheld at the at the Court of Appeal, at the Court of uh, the Supreme Court of Canada. Pardon. Again, Karakatsanis being in the in the majority. Um, so the, the the Supreme Court essentially restated that uh, indigenous rights under Section 35 are sui generis rights. So they they're not personal rights. They're not uh, they're not real rights uh, in terms of like in rem. Um, and in that case, determine jurisdiction. One has to look at the uh, the relief that's being sought, uh, and especially in that case, uh, the nature of uh, declaratory relief. Um, again, and that uh, that reminds us of um, the court's concerns in Anderson. Um, the court was really worried about access to justice, especially where those cases take so much time to get to a higher court um, and take up so many resources for the, the nations who are involved. Um, so the, the court essentially says that the imposition, the arbitrary imposition of colonial borders should not, uh, should not force a, uh, a First Nation litigant to multiply proceedings in various jurisdictions. Um, that would be contrary to reconciliation under Section 35, and that would be contrary to uh, uh, the principles that support uh, access to justice for, for litigants and to all common sense of, proportion, of proportionality in judicial proceedings. Uh, they also, uh, as a, almost as an afterthought, um, uh, addressed uh, the argument on the, forum, on the doctrine of forum non-convenience. Uh, and rejected that uh, rejected rejected the suggestion that uh, another uh, another forum in this case in Newfoundland and Labrador would be better suited or better equipped uh, to uh, uh, to decide the uh, on declaratory relief. Um, so that's a, that's an interesting quote from the Supreme Court's uh, decision. Um, I track your direct your attention to the very last uh, sentence, which is that we do not accept that the later establishment of provincial boundaries should be permitted to deprive or impede the right of Aboriginal peoples to effective remedies for alleged violations of these pre-existing rights. Um, one fun fact uh, about uh, about that case uh, is that. Um, the Supreme Court justice uh, hailing from Newfoundland and Labrador was, of course, in the dissent, uh, along with um, along with Cote, who's not who didn't write the dissent, but she was uh, she was one of the dissenting judges. And the other fun fact is that to this day, the province of Quebec does not uh, still does not recognize the uh, the Labrador Quebec border. So that's uh, 
that's an interesting that's another interesting political issue um Uh, so I'm, I'm mindful of the time, so I'm, I really want to move on to the next decision, which is Des Hotels, uh, which many of you have probably heard about because it was uh, one of the big judicial highlights of uh, 2021 for, for us uh, law nerds. Uh, and it was also one of the decisions that uh, when we last met in 2019 was going to be uh, decided uh, in the in the coming months uh, or years, so we're looking at uh, uh, looking at the, what the court would do. Um, you've you've heard about the decision. You know uh, you know of the facts. Um, an American, Mr. Desautel, was uh, was fined for uh, shooting an elk uh, in BC. Mr. Desautel's defense was based on Section 35 rights. Um, as he claimed that he was a member of uh, the Lakes tribe, which is a descendant of uh, of an indigenous group that is now considered, and pardon the terms, but that's that's the terms that were used by uh, uh, Indian Affairs back in the day, the tribe that was extinct uh, in uh, in Canada uh, for a number of uh, for a number of years. So essentially, the issue was whether uh, whether Mr. Desautel uh, could validly invoke uh, Section 35 rights, even though uh, he's not a uh, an indigenous person currently living uh, currently living in Canada, but rather a member of a of a tribe, at least in the states with uh, historical links to Canada. Um, so the majority of the of the court is interestingly um, concluded that groups of indigenous peoples outside of Canada could also be included in Aboriginal peoples of Canada within the meaning of Section 35. Um, and uh, echoing uh, the uh, the comments on the arbitrariness of colonial borders in the uh, in the Newfoundland decision, um, they recognize that the rights that the indigenous peoples in this country had before uh, uh, European assertion of sovereignty or European conquest uh, could be um, uh, could be extended or could be continued to exist, basically. Um, even though uh, those borders were were drawn uh, were drawn on the map as uh, as colonialism implanted itself and as years uh, as years went on, um, so the in order not to uh, not to open completely the, the floodgate, what the court uh, what the court uh, did was to uh, apply the Van der Peet test to the namely with respect to continuity uh, to uh, to the claim of Mr. Uh, to, of, of Mr. Desautel, uh, keeping in mind that um, as is already included and already contemplated in the Van der Peet test, if there is a, a government action or crown action that prevents uh, an indigenous person or indigenous peoples to uh, exercise their rights, such as imposing a border or as we'll see later on, uh, establishing a school system uh, that does not uh, that will not be sufficient in itself to break the continuity required by uh, uh, the Van der Peet, uh, the Van der Peet test. Surprise, Justice Cote dissented on this uh, in this decision. Um, she took she took the view that. Um, the, the framers of the Constitution Act 1982 uh, strictly intended um, Section 35 to uh, apply to Indigenous peoples currently uh, in Canada. Uh, and um, she also uh, she also raised a lot of uh, uh, a lot of questions with respect to 
what would happen to the, the constitutional mechanisms that we've developed towards uh, indigenous people in, in Canada, if uh, other possible claimants could uh, also avail themselves of those uh, of those mechanisms. For example, how uh, if how does a person like uh, uh, Mr. Desotel uh, uh, or how would the community of Mr. Desotel uh, uh, invoke the right to be consulted and accommodated by the Crown? Uh, how does the honor of the Crown work uh, cross border? Um, and she also um, she also took issue with her, uh, her view that Mr. Desotel in the first place and looking at the Van Der Peet test did not establish continuity. Um, that case is, is, is very interesting and it's very thought provoking because uh, those are quite extraordinary facts that, that American guys shooting in an elk and uh, benefiting from section 35 rights. But I think it, it closer, uh, closer to us and closer to our daily practice. Uh, it's also a reminder and a good basis to uh, to litigate and vindicate rights that find them find themselves to uh, uh, to apply on more than one territory or one that, more than one jurisdiction within uh, within Canada. Too often we see uh, provinces um, recognizing uh, indigenous rights of certain groups in their uh, within their own borders, but uh, having a very closed. Um, uh, almost hostile and uh, uh, exclusionary uh, relationship with those First Nations, which are uh, 500 feet uh, from the border, but on the other side. So um, that uh, that decision really came as a relief when it was uh, when it was issued for all of us who work with communities that, uh, like the Anishinaabe and the uh, in uh, Eastern Ontario and Western Quebec, the uh, the Inu and uh, and Naskapi uh, in the northeastern uh, northeastern Quebec, the Inuit uh, all around the uh, the Arctic uh, the Arctic Circle. Um, so and of course the the Mohawk who uh, uh, in the, in southern Quebec who part who uh, share their their territory between uh, Quebec, Ontario, and the state uh, the state of New York. Uh, so that's a that's a very uh, that's a very uh, interesting decision and quite a, it's quite a relief from a, a practitioner's uh, point of view. Um, very uh, um, quite oh there was a there seems to be a, uh, some questions in the uh, in the chat. I don't are those the those are okay, the previous those are not two, yeah okay. Um, so uh, I'm mindful, again mindful of the time. If I can take a few minutes, I'll really want to talk to you about that uh, that decision. So uh, the next theme being what to expect in the next 12 months. Uh, when I was preparing the presentation, I thought I was very funny because uh, in person uh, I I'm pregnant and I look very pregnant at the moment. So I thought that was funny, but it's. Like it's it's a really dud. Uh, it's quite of a dud in the uh, on Zoom. So uh, here we are. Um, so one of the big uh, one of the big issues, uh, big decisions to watch in the Supreme Court uh, in the next year, or perhaps in even 2024, uh, is the uh, Supreme Court decision on uh, the appeal from the reference. Uh, that the that the court uh, at the Court of Appeal of Quebec with respect to the uh, the act representing uh, uh, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis children, youth, and family, uh, or the act respecting First uh, Nations, Inuit, uh, Métis children, youth, and youth and family. So basically, um, that's that's an act that was. Um, uh, uh, that came uh, that, that came into being uh, after uh, numerous Canadian uh, human rights tribunal decisions uh, that denounced the overrepresentation of indigenous youths in um, 
and uh, children's services across the country. And uh, in addition to that, discriminatory, discriminatory practices uh, towards uh, those uh, children and th those, uh, those young people. Um, the, the approach of the law was to allow uh, was to allow indigenous groups throughout the country to structure their own uh, youth and family services and to have essentially self-determination uh, and self-govern on those uh, on those mechanisms. Um, the province of Quebec uh, chose to uh, chose to contest the application of this act. Uh, on its territory, basically uh, on uh, on the ground that uh, it was uh, that that Canada was legislating uh, in uh, in pr in provincial matters, and that uh, youth and family services, even as as it pertains to um, Indigenous peoples, was uh, within provincial uh, jurisdiction. Um, so there was um, the Quebec government addressed a reference to Quebec Court of Appeal, and let's just say that this uh, this initiative backfired uh, on the Quebec uh, on the Quebec government. So the issues that were asked of the court were whether the act was ultra ultra varies of uh, of Parliament, given the, the province's asserted jurisdiction on uh, child welfare. Um, whether, uh, and that was very interesting from Quebec to argue, uh, whether the act uni unilaterally amended section 35 to include section 35 uh, uh, existing rights, uh, the right of self-government, self-determination, uh, in this case on child and family services. Um, and these and in answering that second question, the Court of Appeal also very interestingly delved into what is the nature of the right uh, to self-government. Um, so, in the first, um, with, with respect to the first, uh, the first argument, um, the um, uh, the court did acknowledge that there was. Uh, to a certain extent, the conflict of jurisdiction between uh, the capacity of parliament to legislate on uh, indigenous children and youth welfare uh, and Quebec's uh, and Quebec's own uh, and Quebec's own jurisdiction, but eventually, um, eventually, only two provisions were uh, were found to be um, constitutionally invalid by. Uh, by the uh, by the Court of Appeal. Uh, so Quebec was not uh, was far from being successful on that uh, uh, on that portion of its uh, of its reference. Um, now with respect to the, the most interesting uh, aspect, um, Quebec did not uh, well the Court of Appeal rather did not um, did not buy into Quebec's argument that uh, Parliament was adding to Section 35 by recognizing uh, Indigenous peoples' rights to self-government in uh, child welfare matters. Uh, on the contrary, the the Court of Appeal um, concluded that it it's already a form of Indigenous rights. It's already protected as a right that's recognized and affirmed by Section 35 because it's interesting. Interesting. Intrinsically, pardon, tied to preservation of culture, language, cultural identity. It goes to the heart of um, what it means to be indigenous and to belong to an indigenous uh, people. Um, it also, the Court of Appeal also clarified that uh, the division of powers uh, in the Constitution Act 19, uh, 18, uh, 1867, pardon. Uh, never extinguished the rights of uh, indigenous peoples to self-government, um, and that there was no um, there was no uh, there was no exercise of jurisdiction, no um, 
no legislation from Quebec or from Canada that had ever um, uh, that had ever regulated the uh, the issue of child wealth, indigenous child welfare, uh, in a way that would amount to valid extinction. So the right was uh, the right was preserved, uh, and is still uh, existing uh, and still existing today. Uh, the court also uh, specified that should uh, should an indigenous group, should the First Nation participate. Uh, in the mechanisms provided by this act and avail themselves of those mechanisms, their legislation would prevail on uh, incompatible provincial legislation. Um, so those uh, um, all those conclusions on uh, the exist the, the right of uh, self-government being uh, being existent today being uh, not having been extinguished, uh, and not being in addition to, to Section 35 rights um, really came as an immense relief um, to uh, to the first uh, to the First Nations of uh, the First Nation and Indigenous groups in Quebec. Um, as an added bonus to uh, to that um, to those conclusions, what's also very interesting is that the court goes into what is of what is the nature of the right to self-government. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they classified it as a generic right um, along, with, uh, along with titles. So a generic right uh, being a right that's tied to, uh, tied to identity uh, and, that, and, and whose contents don't, don't vary from one nation or one group to another. Uh, in other words, uh, titles always define the same way. Uh, if we're talking about the nation in the West or uh, the Inuit or the decrees in, in Quebec. Uh, likewise, the right to self-government um, has the same content, uh, notwithstanding of which nation or which group we're talking about. Um, as a, uh, on the contrary, if you, if you think of a specific right, um, you look at the uh, who can harvest, where you can, when, where, where, uh, where, and when you can harvest uh, specific species uh, with specific methods and tools for a specific purpose. So that would be a specific right. And specific rights are tricky and are difficult in, from a litigation perspective because you you have to bring evidence uh, for a specific First Nation, for a specific site, or a specific. Uh, species or practice, whereas a generic right, um, the the evidentiary requirement is uh, is potentially uh, easier to um, uh, easier to uh, easier to meet. Um, and likewise, and I will uh, I will conclude uh, I will conclude on that. Um, the court uh, the court of appeal lays some. Uh, laid some basis for um, uh, demonstrating uh, generic rights. So they applied the Van der Peet test as modified by, by Delgamuk. So really adopting an approach uh, that's, uh, that's coherent, that's consistent with that generic uh, and unchanging uh, nature. Um, so um, again, I'm, I'm impeding on the time allowed, so I will uh, I will leave it on uh, uh, on on that. And for the for the note there, the the case is going to be heard at the, uh, the Supreme Court this December. So we don't really know uh, when the, a decision will uh, will will come out. There are pretty uh, interesting interveners uh, involved. Uh, so that would really be the the decision to watch uh, next uh, next year. All right. Thank you so much, Karin. I mean, uh, some of our members have emailed me. There's some comments in the chat room. I think we would love to have you back to continue the discussion. You've raised such some interesting, you've identified such interesting content, content, notions, principles. Uh, we're very, uh, very thankful that you've taken the time um, to, to join us today. And if you don't mind, I might circle back to you and we can discuss uh, when we can bring you uh, back uh, for another event in 2023. And hopefully it'll be Nikaluit this time. 
Yes, I would love to, and perhaps uh, we can uh, we can gather for a discussion on the to debrief on that uh, on that decision when it uh, when it's finally decided by the Supreme Court. Yes, I think so the invitation is open. <laughs> Thank you. Merci, merci beaucoup, Caroline. So I just wanted to remind our members that we are recording the event, and I will keep the membership apprised of when we're able to post it. We are uh, we have a YouTube uh, library now, and we're slowly but surely making our CLE events available to our members with permission, obviously, from our guest speaker. So thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful week. Et à la prochaine, Caroline. À la prochaine. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for your for being there. Have a good day.